Good morning, afternoon or evening. Welcome today. We've got a beautiful presentation for you together with Arab Dental Lab. And we're going to talk today about 3D printing, a future to stay. Let me do first a quick introduction of myself. Uh, let me see if my slider works. And for some reason it doesn't. Uh, there it is. Introduction of myself. I don't like to talk about myself, but it's good to know for you guys who I am. My name is Jerome Kleinsma. I'm a certified dental technician and I'm a digital dentistry specialist. I was born in the Netherlands and I'm currently living in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm since 2005 in the digital dental industry. And I started a long time ago and I've got years of experience in manufacturing by now. I am KOL for a lot of 3D printing companies like Asiga, Nextend, Shining, Aeon, Haygears, RapidShape, uh, Sprintray, you, you name it. All these companies are a partner from us and a lot of other industry leading companies. So to tell you a little about what we do is we started the company uh, when I moved to Australia and I started working for a reseller. And I really noticed a massive gap in the industry after the part of the reseller. And the reseller tells already in the name. They, their job is to sell you the proper equipment and help you to get that equipment. And then it's up to you to get the best out of it. But how do you get the best out of it? I always make an analogy like, hey, you buy the best car you can buy, the most fancy race car you can get. But it doesn't make you the fastest driver if you don't know how to handle that car, how to learn to drive that car properly. And this is where we stepped in. So we set up a company and it's called Dentique. And Dentique is a company, let me see, it's for some reason, yeah, ah, there it is. Yeah, this small introduction of it. And Dentique stands for Dental IQ, Dental Knowledge. And with that knowledge, we really want to support really dental specialists like dentists, prosthetists, dental technicians. And we do that in several ways. First of all, we have decided to, with all our knowledge, we want to do training and consultancy. So you have an idea what you want. We're going to chat and we're going to see what equipment would suit you best. Because there are many great systems on the market, but not each system is really suitable for each person. So we're, re we're really going to listen to you what you want, what you want to do, what you want to do in the future, also your budget, and uh, how much knowledge you have and how much time you would like to invest. All these things we can guide you, we can also train you on. Next to that is I'm a firm believer that if we train someone, we have to have that knowledge in-house. We have to do that on a daily basis. Uh, I, so many times I see companies with trainers and they're like, oh, this is how you do it. But they actually have no idea yet how it's really been done because they only get that paperwork. Oh, this is what you have to tell and what you have to explain. So we really use our equipment ourselves because we also have a dental laboratory and most of the equipment we use on a daily basis ourselves so we know the pros the cons how to how to solve a problem when we have it next to that we also do a design service and so for a lot of companies uh, clinics or labs who don't have the right knowledge in-house or the, the right amount of staff we support them by uh, providing a proper design Next to all the support and training, what we do, we have about 18 plus years of experience in digital manufacturing. And with all that experience, we also do a lot of research and development and workflow optimization for actually a lot of companies worldwide. So we are very fortunate. We have a lot of great partners and we work very closely with them. Today, basically our goal is share our knowledge with you today so you can serve your clients and patients the best. So really try to get as much as you can with this information. And look, the good thing is it's going to be recorded so you can re review it and everything. But we're going to give you a lot of tips and tricks and good understanding about 3D printing. So like I said, we're going to talk about 3D printing. And the power of 3D printing is we enabling services and quality to your clients that you could never do before. Um, we work accurate, we work fast, we work reliable. All these things are possible with 
utilizing 3D printing or additive technology. If you haven't started yet, really, now is the moment. If still I talk to people and say, oh, my um, impression and my model, um, I think is way more accurate than a digital uh, scan and a printed model. And there I have to stop immediately everyone because scanning and 3D printing is actually so much more accurate than any other kind of technology that we have now available. Um, it has been proven already for so many years that this technology is so accurate and reliable. And look, my business completely, I don't even have a plaster room anymore. I only accept digital cases. I'm a fully digital lab uh, when it comes to cases coming in and everything. Um, so uh, there are a lot of benefits when we talk about 3D printing. And one of the benefits is that we use a very high accurate technology because that's what we want. We want the best fitting, best margins, best contact points, everything we can think of. And that needs to be very accurate. So we're using 3D printing because every single time we can achieve the same results. We want to uh, minimize human error eh? where we work with our hands and the more people work on a case, the more can go wrong, the more chances of failure. And not saying that the staff is bad or you, the team itself, but the more we do by our hand, and as, especially as a human, when we start to doing things on an automated pilot, we might even forget things. And the less we touch it, the better it is. So we don't have to pour our plaster models. And because again, this is the inaccuracy. You have taken the impression. Impression might not be the most 100% accurate. You're pouring a model. Something can go wrong with the powder or uh, liquid ratio. The pouring can go wrong. The waiting time. All these things you don't have anymore. Not only that is technically how long do you have to wait till a plaster model is properly set? Most of the time, it's still 24 hours before the expansion, moisture, and all that stuff. So with 3D printing, I can immediately, after I've done the design, print the model, work on it, whatever needs to be done. Reproducibility. If something goes wrong, all I have to do is say print again. I don't have to go to my clinicians and say, hey, something went wrong with the impression. It's, it's, it, we pull, pulled the impression, it's, it's broken or whatever. We don't have that problem anymore. We can directly hit print and do a next one. Not only that is you can promote yourself really as state of the art. And I think that's very important. I mean, who, who doesn't want to be helped by the best team that is available in your country? They have the newest equipment, the most accurate equipment, the most, basically the best tools. So you can promote yourself like that. And this is a little bit of a joke, but actually it's kind of true because it performs on Monday the same as on Friday. We all know on Thursday and Friday, we're already with our head into the weekend. What are we going to do? Are we going to see our friends or family? Are we going to have some great times? Uh, so we're not focusing on work. And on Monday and Tuesday, we're still recovering from a fun weekend we had with our family and friends. So really the only real productive day is actually the Wednesday. And like I said, it's a little bit of a joke, but... I do think there's a certain amount of truth in that one. So we see already we've got a lot of benefits over here when we use 3D printing. Not only that, and this is something if I compare it, for example, with 3D printing with milling technology. And so milling or uh, uh, plastering models, pour, uh, trimming models and all that stuff is there are more benefits with 3D printing actually because we don't have any milling dust. We have no noise, no broken burrs. Basically, no real maintenance cost and no real consumable cost except for the trays and the resins we're using. We don't need a high-end compressor that, are, that can be very costly or a vacuum system or anything. We don't need an expensive cam software because actually most of the time it's included with the printers and otherwise it's for a small subscription now available depending on the system. Uh, but what I find actually the biggest benefit with everything with 3D printing is there is no drill compensation. Therefore, we can make a thinner restoration. So for the ones who don't really know what a drill compensation is, let me explain that through in this way. I've made a little drawing for you guys that you have an idea how it is. So I'm drawing here um, the, the die. Huh? So 
it's a cut uh, section of the die, so you hopefully can uh, can see that. We on top of that, we're now uh, drawing the crown, and uh, this is well, the inside of the crown. There we go, the outside. Forgive me, my drawings are not the best, but uh, hopefully everyone can understand and see what I'm saying. And when we are milling, for example, the crown on the inside, uh, we have our milling burr that goes all the way to the top on the inside of the crown. And let's say that milling burr is one millimeter thick. If it goes into the crown and it touches already the sides, the top, it can't go any higher. So that area um, is basically not drilled out. So what the software is doing, and that's called a drill compensation, is for that area to get uh, the, the tip of the die to get all the way in there. The drill compensation is basically a part in the software where we're gonna drill out some extra material. So now the top of the milling burr reaches the top of where the top of the die is. And that's called drill compensation. So we're going take a little bit extra way. That means now the crown sits all the way properly down. What is the benefit? Well, because we have that drill compensation, if you look on the left side, if we have drill compensation and the wall thickness is much smaller because we got the outside of the crown and we got the inside of the crown with the drill compensation, suddenly my space may be being halved. A half of the material thickness. So you will see that you will have a weak crown, you will have aesthetically um, uh, compromised. So if we don't have drill compensation, because that's not necessary with 3D printing, because we don't use a milling burr or a drill, we gain suddenly the entire thickness of the crown. We keep that and nothing is going to change that. So we are much more, uh, we're way better, sorry, we are way better in getting aesthetic results in that way. So we don't have this with additive manufacturing. So it's a real benefit. So what can we 3D print in dental at the moment? Well, we all start somewhere and we all start with the first thing and that's actually a dental model. And why do we 3D print a dental model? We 3D print a dental model actually just to make sure we check our work and to make sure that when we deliver a crown, we can show to the clinical team, look, this is the scan you provide us. We made a crown that fits beautifully in contact point, in occlusion, in articulation, you name it. We've done our work properly. Here is the proof. Not only that, you can make finalize the uh, contact points and everything like that. Another thing we make is, for example, custom trays. Custom trays are still very popular and very easy to design and 3D print. A custom tray, I don't think I have to explain it, but still the benefit of a custom tray is that when we have our initial uh, scan, we design a tray with let's say one or two mil uh, spacer for our impression material. We put our operation material in there. We take the secondary impression uh, with a custom tray because it's everywhere the same spacing, the same thickness, the material sets the same. So the shrinkage, the setting of the material is the same, so it's way more accurate. Another thing we make, for example, and this is actually one of my favorites, is a diagnostic wax up or study models. And why is that my favorite? Well, what we do actually, especially in Australia, is we make a lot of diagnostic wax ups. And I do that on the computer. I 3D print my model with the new teeth in position. And after printing, as good as we can print, as, as the best printers we might have, you can sometimes still see those fine print lines. And what I do, I take a little bit of a glazing material like an opti glaze or even a little bit of resin, you're possible, paint a little tin layer on top of that, light cure that so there are no print lines anymore, it's nice and smooth. Take the clinical or putty key over that one and the clinical team can inject that directly into the patient's mouth and use that as a motivational workshop, for example. Or even when the preps have been done, use it to make temporary uh, crowns, temporary bridges. Um, because the print lines are already removed and it's all smooth, once it's injected with a composite, a flowable composite or temporary material, the clinical team doesn't have to polish for a long time because it's already nice and smooth. So the workflow is much faster and much more efficient. Another fun, fun thing is what we do a lot actually is night guards or splints 
I absolutely love them. Nowadays, we 3D print our splints. Once it comes off the uh, printer, I just clean them, take off the uh, light cure them, of course, take off the support pins and polish them and send them off. It's a good and easy product, actually. And we absolutely love them. Another thing we can do, for example, is castable uh, patterns. So, for example, we designed an RPD. We want to uh, print that in a castable material and then turn it into uh, a metal, uh, um, a, a chrome, titanium, whatever we want to do. It is really possible. Clear aligners. Clear aligners very popular. So we have we 3D print uh, the model and we do a thermal forming or a shock down over it, trim the aligner finish it and send that off it's a really good revenue actually for for each company um the other thing that we now and doing and is actually becoming more popular but i do have to say i don't think it's definitely there yet but it will come is direct aligners a direct clear aligner so we direct directly print them clean them and the entire process but this is something of the future that will definitely come Another thing, surgical guides. I think plenty of you are also using surgical guides. Um, there's nothing easier than basically design a surgical guide, plan the implant, plan uh, where the, the sleeve comes, uh, plan the uh, guide itself, 3D print it, put the sleeve in, and you're ready to go. Another really cool thing, and this is something that is really upcoming for the following years. A lot of companies are investing a lot of uh, resources into that. It is uh, a hybrid material, and so we can 3D print or temporary and even long-term crowns. And in the slide, it says permanent because the entire world still calls it permanent. I don't like to call it permanent, and for one reason only. Who can really promise to the patient that it's forever? None of us, not the lab, not the clinician. So I like to call it the long term. Um, but we can definitely print them. And later on, you will see quite some samples of them. Um, I'm a big fan of this. Uh, I'm doing this for the last three and a half, nearly four years now. And it's become a really popular product also uh, out of our laboratory. Lingual retainers. Um, this is a lingual retainer, and i show you a little bit later. It's made in zirconium. Um, secret, it's 3D printed. Um, but it's really cool, so we can make our retainer like that, bond that, and we got a beautiful solution. Another thing is full arch, yeah, multi-unit abutment or direct to fixture. We can 3D print the entire arch put a little bit of composite or even like uh, gingiva resin on the outside. And in my eyes, that looks really amazing. Is it for permanent? Well, I'm, I'm probably do it as a long term and especially to check if the design has been done correctly. Hey, we all know when we do full arch cases, the most difficult part is if we don't even have existing dentition, is is my bite correct? Is my vertical dimension correct? All these things, is everything correctly uh, registered? And with this one, we can really check that, make small adjustments, scan it again, and then make, for example, the final case. And that works really well. Another cool thing is actually uh, try in or dangers immediate dangers, all these things. So we print the teeth. Now, I prefer always to print in bridges because what's the weakest thing of uh, any danger that is a single tooth. Now, it's quite easy to push out a single tooth or a single tooth breaks. When you've got a full arch case, a full arch bridge, or even segmented in, let's say, an uh, anterior bridge and two posteriors, then we got a very strong solution. We print the base in a pink material, bond the teeth in there, and finish it and ready to go. So the one you see on the screen on that one is only polished. And this is a, a, a sample I did about two and a half years ago. And it's it's still uh, one of the best I, I've seen and I've came across that how good we are able to create a really great solution for a patient by utilizing 3D printing. Um, so I want to show you a couple of examples that you have an idea how great 3D printing is and how you can be amazed by 3D printing. 
So this is a crown I've 3D printed and I've done nothing to it. It just comes out of the printer and I've just polished that up a little bit. And you see an A3 is a beautiful A3. Another one, beautiful crown. Another A3, just out of the printer, polished, ready to go. Um, this is a very interesting case. This is a case with, uh, I believe this is the brand Ceramax implants from Switzerland. This is a metal-free implant. So the implant is made out of zirconia. The, the uh, titanium base here, well, it's not a tie base, it's a zirconium base now. And uh, the um, is made also out of zirconia. The screw is a carbon fiber screw. And on top of that, we made a crown that is also a metal free and holistic material. And so we got a completely metal free restoration we have done. And that works really well. Another one, just a little crown, um, almost like an onlay. This was an, actually an interesting case. Is it the best aesthetics? Definitely not. I will never say that on this case. However, this is a case where the patient had existing teeth, the, the three centrals, and she wanted to maintain exactly the same teeth. So what we've done, we've done a copy. We copied the shape of the existing teeth. We removed them digitally. We designed an RPD frame, basically like an acetal frame. I milled the frame. I 3D printed the teeth, put a key over it, then injected with cold curing, basically, uh, the, uh, the uh, acrylic, the pink acrylic, finished it, and we've got now a beautiful solution. Patient has still exactly the same teeth as they used to have, but now they've got a removable solution. Another crown, this is from one of my clients. Um, it turned out a little bit bright, um, but it also has to do because of the picture, but I have seen it in real, and actually looks quite good. This is actually one of my best cases I'm actually most proud of. This is where we 3D printed the crown in a B1 color. And all I've done is I polished it, nothing else. So by using reflection by relief, uh, surface texture and everything, we get a really high aesthetic result. Um, another thing is a three unit bridge. This has been done by the university in Zurich. And actually, they made that bridge that well that the patient never came back, as far as I understood. So one tip, never make your temporaries that great, because you always want the patient back. Uh, again, a little bit of a joke, but of course it is true. And all these materials that you see now is, I'm a big fan of one brand in uh, Switzerland that is called Ceramco. And Ceramco is one of the best 3D printing resins in a silica infiltrated hybrid resin. And till now, with all the tests I've seen, long-term tests, this is one of the first materials that came on the market, but still one of the best. Um, so trust me on that one. Have a check out on that material. Um, also, this one is, uh, we all know, any case that is a C or D color is quite complex to make. So what I've done, I 3D printed it in a white, in a snow white, and I stained it up to a C color, and that came out really great. Another case that has been done by one of my clinicians, also I am uh, very proud of uh, to know and work together, is Dr. Gordon Bird. Here we may, here he has made a uh, temporary uh, bridge. This is for a patient who had jaw cancer. They removed a part of the jaw, put some new bone from his body into the jaw, and on top of that placed this bridge. And that stays for, I understood, about a year, a year and a half into the mouth before they're going to finalize the, uh, the permanent restoration. So it is really good. This one is also, I I'm kind of think, is quite cool. Of course, we see the inflammation around the gingiva. That gives away which tooth it is. But if we would cover our hand yeah, on top of the inflamed gingiva, I don't think it's really easy to see which tooth we have done. And actually, this case looks, in my eyes, amazing. These are uh, six units, six units all 3D printed. They um, have been uh, as a temporary, and uh, I think in the end, the temporary even looked better than the permanent uh, solution. Another one is, like I said, I'm a big fan of splints. Uh, so it's quite easy to 3D print and polish them, and this is how they come out. We have a perfect splint 
every single time. And we're going to run some splint courses also. Um, so there is definitely uh, a lot to learn about how to do proper splints, but how easy it will be to finalize them and get over every single time the best result. I'm going to show you now one. This was an interesting case. Um, unfortunately, we were not able with this implant system to have an angulated screw system. So we decided together with the clinician um, to have the screw channel just labially. This was a temporary crown anyway. So um, if we would uh, forget that the screw hole is there, I think we've got a beautiful temporary uh, solution. It's fully a 3D printed implant crown, stained and glazed. and ready to insert another beautiful one is this is from for example strauman smile in a box and uh, this is for one of the courses we have done that we can 3d print all the uh, arch cases all the implant uh, surgical guides and ready to go so this is the this is doable in a matter of basically i printed this in two three days in total including finishing so within three days i had all these cases finished and we are ready to go so you've seen now a lot of beautiful things about uh, 3d printing please forgive me i'm gonna take a little sip of water so how can we achieve good prints well actually or how can we achieve better prints well it is following protocol Every single time we would have to do the same thing. If we cannot keep changing every time something and something goes wrong, we don't know where it went wrong. So please, everything you do in any manufacturing uh, environment, always follow protocol. And one of the things is to uh, understand also what are the basics of 3D printing. If you understand the real basics, um, you can achieve better results. But only when something goes wrong, you easily recognize where it went wrong and how to adjust that. So let me talk to you a little bit about the basics of 3D printing. And what are the basics of 3D printing? Well, we all know that probably that Michelin man, I love to call them the fat rolls. Huh? This is layer upon layer. When we did the first printers, the FDM printers, that is with an ex uh, a piece of wire, plastic wire that goes to a heated nozzle and been put on, that technology is basically the same. The, basic of three, the basics of 3D printing is building layer upon layer until we created a three-dimensional object. But we have to keep a couple of things in consideration. And one of the things is that object height divided by layer height is my time. And how is that? Well, let's say my object height is 0 0.8 of a millimeter. And each layer that we're going to make is 0 0.2. We only need four layers. Quite easy, right? However, let's pretend that each layer takes 10 seconds. So I have to have four layers of 10 seconds. Gives me 40 seconds. Okay. If I want a smaller layer height, because I want a little bit uh, smaller lines, then instead of having a 0 0.2, a millimeter layer thickness i'm going for example half of it 0 0.1 i suddenly instead of need four layers i suddenly need eight layers what does that going to do with my time going from four to eight layers that will go from 40 seconds to roughly 80 seconds at double the amount of time so the more layers we have the more time it takes to print hope that makes sense so for example I've got my phone, oh, my phone is over here. Yeah. And when I've got my phone like this, I've got a very small object and yeah, the object is very small. So I only need a couple of layers to get my object printed. Let's say this takes 10 minutes. But if I orient my object differently like that, suddenly my height has become bigger. Now I need instead of 10 minutes, I maybe need 30 to 40 minutes to print this. However, the benefit is I, if I have my platform, I can locate and position multiple objects on it instead of just one. So it is a lot of details in how to orient objects that determines how long the printing takes. Okay.
So a lot of people are always like, oh yeah, but my printer is this accurate and that accurate. And that doesn't say a lot of things because really where do we get our accuracy? That is on the X and Y dimension on a printer. How accurate those pixels or the light source actually is. And the Z dimension, that is really the layers, is telling me a little bit more about the smoothness and the details. So how can we check that? Well, for example, uh, we have a pyramid over here. Uh, the one on the left is still a pyramid, but it has a couple of layers only, so it has rough, big steps. On the right side, we still have a pyramid, but instead of big steps, we got a lot of small steps. Now suddenly, it's still a pyramid, but it is much more smooth, and you see a lot more details. For example, with this one, the sphere or the dome, huh? the more layers you have, the more smooth and the more details we see. Okay, another thing we can think about is, hey, remember I told you about, hey, if I orient my object like this vertically, I've got higher object, my print time takes longer. Well, there are a couple of things we can think about, and that is, for example, when we have an object, we have to put it in layers. We can also have, that's called something, it's called adaptive slicing. And adaptive slicing, instead of having always the same layers, we're going to do the first couple of layers, big steps. And we, for example, the bottom of a model is not as interesting because we only need the detail in the top. So the first parts we're going to print in big steps, that goes much faster. And then we go in fine layers, so we see a lot more detail. And that's called adaptive slicing. So we've now really talked about what are the basics of 3D printing, and that is layer upon layer to get an object. And the finer the layers, the more smoothness, the more details we have, but also the more layers we have, the more print time it will take. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the technology itself. So there are a couple of technologies that we're using, and the technology we're really using in and uh, dental is basically the SLA or DOP UV technology. And this is really um, how it works with um, 3D printing when we do uh, with resin printing. And how come? Well, basically we have our build fat or our resin tank and we put a photopolymer resin in there. And a photopolymer resin, basically see it like a plasma, in that plasma are particles that are reacting to UV light. So when it comes in contact with UV light, it solidifies, it becomes solid. And in between all those particles are also pigmentation, the color. And so all this technology, this kind of UV photopolymer technology is basically been invented by Chuck Hall in 1984, basically the founder of 3D systems. And how does it now work? Well, we got our resin tank with our photopolymer resin. We got our platform in there that goes all the way down. And then once it's all the way down and created one little thin layer, underneath a light source goes on, goes off, platform goes back up, and hopefully the part that has been cured, that has been solidified, sticks to the platform. We go back down again, we create another layer of resin, light goes on, light goes off, and it keeps going and going. And like I said, we got our resin tank here. In that resin tank, we put our photopolymer resin and that reacts with UV light, and underneath is a UV light source. Okay, so a little bit more details. Yeah, the platform goes down. Once it's down, a layer of resin, light goes on, light goes off, and that layer sticks to the other layer or to the platform. And this is how you slowly build an object and it becomes bigger and bigger because every time material is added to that object. I think that's quite easy. When we started with 3D printing, actually one of the first we started with was with uh, the technologies called SLA. And that is by a laser, selective laser. And the company that really started with creating something like that is Formlabs. You know, we've got, for example, the Formlabs 3B now. And it has a platform, it has a resin tank, and underneath is a laser as a light source. The other ones we are using is a DOP SLA technology. Uh, for example, the Asiga, the Nexen 5100, the Sprint Ray Pro, um, 
the S95, uh, the uh, 55 and all those systems. And we got the MAST SLA technology, the Accurata next Gen LCD one, the Shining, uh, those printers. We're going into a little bit more details later about that. But what's the big difference? Well, if we look at the top left, we see our light source from the laser, uh, the SLA laser, and that is a round circle. The light source is a round circle. So once it goes, over the platform, it creates a sharp line. The DOP works a little bit different. The DOP is a uh, technology that uh, works like a DOP projector, like we watch a movie or anything, that kind of projector what you have on the wall. That is the same type of technology in there, and that is pixel-based. And then the other one is the MAST SLA, that is also a pixel-based uh, technology in LCD. There's always a flatbed of LEDs are on, and on top of that one is a mask, and that mask will activate or deactivate the pixels by turning them off and on. And if they're off, the light shines through. If they're on, it's black and no light penetrates. So the resin that's above that will not solidify. I hope that makes sense a little bit. Let's go a little bit more in detail about each technology itself. For example, here we've got the SLA. We got our platform that goes all the way down into our resin tank with our photopolymer resin. We've got underneath a laser beam and a scanning mirror. And that mirror goes, that moves a little bit uh, left and right. So it goes, it, sh it, it basically moves that laser point over the entire surface of that platform, of the build platform. And here we can see that the printed parts, number one, the support pins that are needed, the resin is in there and all those things. And so that laser goes in there that's been reflected and goes up. The difference is with the SLA technology is that laser moves and has to touch every single point. So it has to go all the way around. So the more objects I have on my platform, the longer the printing will take. And this is one of the disadvantages of an SLA technology. Yes, it is very accurate, it's very smooth, it's a great technology, but because that laser point has to touch every single area by itself, because it's just a single laser point in that way, it takes a little bit longer. Okay, if we talk about DOP technology, and this is why actually DOP printers are way more expensive, because there's only one manufacturer of the uh, DOP uh, chip, and that is Texas Instruments. They are the only one who can make these. So that technology of 3D printing works the same. The only difference we have here, instead of having our laser, is we have our projector. And instead of one single laser point, it shines or displays basically the entire layer at once. And the same when we watch a movie on the wall, uh, we see everything. We don't only see one pixel, no, we see the entire screen. And that's the same with this. So it lights only what it needs to light, so it goes really the entire layer by layer by layer. So that technology is way faster. Because of the projector is a very strong light source, the photopolymer resins most of the time for DOP printers are way more sensitive. So they light cure or set and solidify much faster. So this technology can also print a lot faster. Look, for example, at one of the printers, uh, the Next End 5100. It is one of the fastest printers in our, in our industry because it uses a figure four and that is basically we printing on a layer of air and the um, photopolymer resin cures or sets really fast. So those two top components together allows us to print up to 140 millimeters an hour. 14 centimeters an hour is really fast. Um, other great printers like this is the Asiga, for example. And the Asiga have also, with that projector, they have got a huge benefit is they are open to 500 plus different resins, but the biggest benefit I also see, especially hardware wise, is they got a radio meter inside that printer that measures how strong is my light source. If my light source is getting older over the years and you've been used a lot and it becomes weaker and the light becomes less, it pushes a little bit more power into the projector. So the projector shines nearly at the same rate when it was new. 
So it goes much longer with us and we always have a more consistent uh, quality in, from the light source. And that's a really good way. So these are already two type of printers that are really good in the market. And that's why DOP is so popular. Like I said, the DOP is very popular, but that printer is also quite pricey. So what do we have? Another technology is the MAST SLA. And I said that before, hey, this is a technology where we have an entire uh, uh, array of light source, the LEDs and everything they're all on. On top of that is a layer, a digital mask, and that will be turned off and on. And if it's off and it becomes transparent, the light goes through. If it's on, it's black and it blocks the light. So this technology is great. It is a much more efficient technology. It works basically the same as we have our TV that we watch on normal uh, TV at home. Um, so those light sources are way yeah, more cost effective. Technology is a little bit slower, but also a lot of manufacturers have found great ways of speeding that up and still delivering at the highest quality we can get. So also these are really great uh, systems. One downside is that sometimes there might be the chance because of the technology is a little bit more simplified, you might have to replace that light source. Don't worry, they're quite cheap. It's quite easy to open up the printer, take it out, unplug it, put the new one in, plug it in and ready to go. So all these things are very cool or a lot of great technology. But one thing I want to emphasize is really is uh, when we are really doing printing for dental and everything that is going into the mouth, for example, we have to make sure it's safe. And safely 3D printing, and especially with biocompatible resins, it is so important that we do the right thing. So, for example, is we got a couple of classifications. We got a class one a medical device class one, medical class device two or 2A, depends on the country where you are. Um, so medical class device one is basically um, anything that goes into the mouth short term, a custom tray um, or uh, sometimes even some of them even um, say a splint is that like that. But anything that goes into long term into the mouth, like a tooth, like a denture or all that stuff, that has to be a longer and a different registration. Also, the materials needs to be better tested. Then we got actually a third one, and that is one nobody talks about, and that is the non-classified. That's anything like a model, because we 3D print a model, but it doesn't go into the mouth. But we want to make sure that the particles on the model are properly light cured, because we don't want to contaminate everything else that we make, and it goes into the mouth. Also, never mix any solution for non-bio materials. And what do I mean with that? Well, let me show you a little bit in the next one. When we do, for example, cleaning, when we clean our 3D printed parts. Uh, 3D printing is a great technology and a lot of people, oh, I've got a 3D printer and I'm there. No, you have to understand that we have to have a scan or digitalize an impression with a uh, lab scanner, for example. Then we have to design something, a model, a crown, a splint, you name it. Then we have to 3D print it. Then we have to clean it because once it's 3D printed, there's still resin sticking on the outside of the object that is not solidified. And we need to take that off before we do the final light curing to make sure it's safe to use. So we have to clean it and then have the final light curing. So that cleaning, that is very important. Only 3D printing self and everything around is only 30% of your workflow. The most important part is I find personally is cleaning and light curing because if you don't do that correctly, whatever we've done up front has filled already. So when we clean, we can clean a couple of different ways. We can clean in a, cl in a clinical environment. For example, we use an automated system. This is a tornado with one and two paths. There is a fully automated system. There are those twisting machines. There are, Sprint Ray has their system that it fully puts one um, IPA tank, first cleaning solution, washes it, pumps it out, put the second one in, and so on. Or we have a lab environment. For example, we use an ultrasonic device and we use single containers. 
And I, you know, just the containers just behind my head, I see. My apologies for that one. I just use a container that I can close off. And for every material I use, I have a number A, that's the dirty one, and number B, that's my clean one. And if we go in back to this one, do not mix with solutions for non-biomaterials. It's so important that, for example, I do not mix or clean a splint in the same cleaning solution that I use for my models. Because then you will contaminate your splint with a non-classified material. Also, all these cleaning stations and automated systems are great. But more, actually, you can only use them for one type, air for an non-medical uh, or non-biomaterial, a class one or a class two. And even I prefer to separate everything even more. For each material, I've got my own solution. So what kind of solutions do we actually have? Well, we got two of them that we really use widely. One of them is called an IPA, isopropyl alcohol, ranging from 70% all the way up to 100%. Or is 100% better to clean no not so much but because it's a higher concentrate it takes longer for it to dilute so the working part how long i can work with it takes much longer so it's widely available it's a low cost it's vaporized but it has a couple of disadvantages it has a potent smell and it's very flammable and in some countries people are not because of religion for example not able to use that material so what else do you have well something else that just came to the market i am using it actually for a couple of years now because i've been testing and helping uh, the company to uh, look into these materials it's a cleaning concentrate ceramco is one of the brands that has that we've got a couple of other brands but i'm a big fan like i said before from ceramco and this is just a concentrate so i've got three liters of that material I mix it with uh, clean water and I suddenly got a 15 liter solution. It doesn't vaporize, it smells nice, it's non-flammable. And because I only, it's a concentrate, I save a lot on freight costs. So this works really well. So we got also uh, two solutions for that. So one thing I always want to discuss, and I think that's my duty as any... Let me know when I can continue. Okay, we can. Okay, so one of the things I also find very important is safety. Uh, it's not so much only for the things we do, but especially also for ourselves. And one of the things is the PPE, personal safety. And um, I find it important to explain these, especially because we are training people how to do the right thing. And safety is very important for me. So one of the things I always say also, when you do 3D printing or even your cleaning, make sure it's on a stable surface. So don't put your printer on a wobbly table. So once you walk past that table, the printer starts wobbling and hey, technically your, fill, your print might have filled already. The same is with a cleaning solution. When you are doing that with alcohol and the alcohol falls or anything, that can give a big mess. So try always to print on a stable surface. Also print on an easy to clean surface. For example, all my printers are on a stainless steel bench. If I have some kind of resin sp spill, it's for me very easy. Spray a little bit of alcohol, wipe it off, and my bench is clean. Also, my printers are always clean. There's no reason why a printer should be dirty. That's pure laziness in my eyes. Also, work in a well-ventilated area with extraction. Even though printers are and we don't have dust or anything, we still have print fumes. And that is a chemical inside. The, the resin itself is a chemical until it has been properly light cured. So make sure there's proper ventilation. Also, all my resins are stored in a very special cabinet that is constantly air filtered. So my working environment is actually very clean. Also, Use safety goggles. We only got one pair of eyes. I'm wearing glasses, for example. Um, that helps me already, but make sure that you can't spill any resins in your eye. Also work with nitro gloves. No latex and especially not powdered gloves because that powder can go into your resin and can contaminate or even arrange a failed print. Why do I say work not with nitro? Well, Two reasons. First of all, nitro gloves are much stronger, so the chance that it rips is, is small. But also, nitro doesn't react as much as uh, latex. Latex can give a reaction with certain resins, and it's also with alcohol. 
So make sure that you protect your hands. Not only that work with a lab coat or protective clothing. I'm, I'm wearing a nice dress shirt, fully proud with my logo, of course, but you don't want to get your clothes dirty. So at least try to protect yourself. So in order to um, 3D print and to understand more, we also want to know what does it really cost? Well, that really depends on what kind of printer we have, what kind of resin. But I'm going to give you now an average and also about the print times. For example, when we 3D print a crown, the material wise is roughly less than $4 per unit. And it can take us, depending on the printer, between 15 and 40 minutes. Ah, so some prints are very fast, some prints are a little bit slower, and it depends on how much layers you want to print. If you want to print fast, you do bigger layers, but that means you need more processing because you see more lines. I hope that makes sense for you. If I, if I do that for a crown, um, roughly around $10, that takes about 10 to 25 minutes. If I do a splint that is less than 15 US dollars, that takes about 30 to 360 minutes. Wow, 360 minutes, you say? Uh, yes. And I'll tell you exactly why. For example, um, I'm a big fan, and I'm, look, I've got many printers, um, but one of my favorites for splints in, at this stage is the Asiga because I use the Ultra Gloss tray. And that Ultra Gloss tray allows us to print so smooth, I hardly have to polish my splints, or technically I don't even have to polish my splints after 3D printing. But because of that technology only allows to have very small layers to create that very smooth surface, I have a much higher print time. So my print time takes much, and my printing time is much longer like that. The same is for a denture, for example. I can choose to do it conventionally on a normal settings. I can print the denture upright in about 120 minutes easily, or I can put it in a special tray and it comes out more shiny, so I have to do less polishing or changing things. Then it takes me much longer. And so a denture, it costs roughly less than $30. $15 for the teeth, $15 for the base, merge them together, I'm ready to go. So you see those cost of materials are not very high. It is actually a very cost effective way. So for example, what is also a real benefit in comparison with anything with milling, for example, if we, let's say print a crown, or sorry, let's start, it, okay, let's mill a crown. A crown milling takes 14, 15, up to 20 minutes to mill a crown. That means that the milling machine can do only one unit at a time. It only works on one unit. If I have a printer, I can put my entire platform full with crowns and it does the same time really, but then for all those crowns. And so up to 40 minutes, what it take, uh, sorry, 25 minutes. That's just a little bit longer than one unit for a crown. Um, it is easy to do, and I've got many more units like that. So it's a really good way of, of, of cost effectively mainstreaming and optimizing your workflows, and especially how, keeping the cost low. So the future of 3D printing is also something I want to talk to you about, because where are we going? And look, we all see different things. There are plenty of trade shows, and this is a little bit my view where we are going. These are the big mainstreams. Look. I'm testing a lot of materials. I'm testing a lot of equipment. Unfortunately, I am not allowed to tell everything. Uh, so I do know what is coming. But what is really what I'm telling you now is really what where we see the future also heading to. And so the future of 3D printing and nearby and far away is, um, for example, 3D printing of zirconia. And I am one of the very few who have a zirconium printer. So I 3D print. 3D print zirconium structures and full arch cases, for example. It is a commercially available 3D printer, and especially in certain countries, it is a very good solution. We can 3D print really beautiful things like veneers, copings, full crowns, or anything like that. And these are um, a four unit case I've uh, 3D printed. And you see, it really looks very smooth. And this is before sintering. But we can 3D print a substructures, a portion of fused zirconia, monolithic crown and bridges, orthodontic brackets that are custom made, for example, for 
patients specifically, or even uh, abutments, implant parts are technically able to do if you have the certification or clarification for that. It is really a great solution. However, another one that I want to talk about is uh, the printing of lithium dye silicate. Litos is one of the companies they announced also during the last IDS that they uh, have a have a cooperation with Ivoclar. They developed a an, um, an lithium dye silicate printer. However, the cost of a printer like that is still very high. So unless those cost of the printer is going down, it still takes a little bit before it will really take off. But the technology of 3D printing lithium dye silicate, it's amazing. It's a game changer if that comes commercially more available. It is a good solution, so we can't wait till this really hits the market. Another thing that has been announced during the last IDS at the International Dental Show in Germany every two years is another type of printer. And it's basically, a, we call it a polyjet uh, tech, uh, printer that is multi-layers. So we're going to do a monolithic multicolor 3D printing. For example, you 3D print, let's say, a denture with the pink and the teeth all at once. It's one monolithic part already in multicolors. And it's a great technology, still a little bit on the high price side. Also that will drop in the near future and then it becomes more affordable and accessible for everyone. Another technology I've seen is called the Zores technology is where we 3D print in one material in one color. And by changing the temperature light frequency and duration of the UV lights during final curing, we can also change the color of our object. For example, if we do a um, danger and the teeth, first I'm going to put it in and everything fine, do it a couple of times, the teeth becomes to go tooth color and everything. Then I put an opaque on top of the teeth, almost like um, paint. So light cannot go onto the teeth. And then I put it back in the machine and then because it starts um, light curing even more, the gingiva area turns into the pink part really. And then I can steam off the paint and I've got a danger that looks like pink and tooth color all at the same material. It's a, it's, it's a little bit similar. Um, and so it's still a monolithic multicolor actually 3D printing. And it's a really cool, cool technology. So these are the real highlights, I think, where we're going with 3D printing at this stage. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of changes except for the materials. So materials are developing every single time and they're coming better materials onto the market. So if you haven't stepped into the market of 3D printing, do it now. Because if you have to do it later, you might have missed that boat and you are already behind with the rest of the market, with your competitor, with your friends who are already doing it. It is easy to do. Once you know the steps and you do it correctly, you will always have great aesthetic results and you will have minimum amount of failed prints or better, none. So what is also very important to understand when you go 3D printing is that you have to trust in what you're doing. Trust that you have the right software. So make sure you choose the right software for your designs, for your post-processing, for your uh, printing, everything like that. Make sure you've got the right hardware. Make sure you've got the right computer, for example. And one of the big things is when we talk about digital technology, especially in dental, is a lot of uh, labs um, and also clinics, they still work with an old computer. I'm like, invest into a new computer. If you have to wait a long time before your calculation, your design, your slicing, your print settings have been done, you're losing time. And time is money. And it frustrates people. Always make sure you got the latest computer when you make sure. I do it myself, for example. Every two to three years, I upgrade. And after three to four years, I basically replace my entire system and got a fresh system. So I always have the latest technology. Use the right materials that are approved. How do you know? Go to your reseller, ask for the certification, make sure that they sell you what they are allowed to sell you. So do a little bit of your own resource. And now choose the right partner for your support. Everybody needs support. Everybody needs the help they can get. 
So invest into that, invest into yourself. Like I said in the beginning of the, to today's webinar, I said, you can buy the most expensive car, but if you don't invest into yourself be, to becoming a better driver, you will not be able to make that car go any faster than your own ability. So invest also in yourself, train yourself, hire a trainer um, who has experience, make sure they teach you the right things, how to do it, and you become so much more efficient and much better in your work. And also make sure you've got a certified workflow, and it has also to do with the right materials. In the end, you're making something for the patient. You want to make sure you do the right thing. So don't try somewhere off eBay, get some materials. Even they on eBay, they say, oh, no, it's certified. It's safe to go. Or we can name them all. They are widely available. Please don't. You will hurt, in the end, the patient. So make sure you've got a safe thing to do. I think we covered already a lot for today. Um, so. Actually, we are towards the end of our webinar, and I would like, on behalf of Arab Dental Lab, Lab or M Dentique and myself, would like to thank you for participating today. And there's only one final thing that I would like to give you. Um, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy a 3D printer. And that's a kind of the same thing. For me, it is, I love 3D printing. So reach out to us or to Arab Dental Lab, or if you want to learn more about manufacturing and especially 3D printing in general. Please follow us on social media, and if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Mr. Jerome, and wish to meet you soon again. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to working closely with you to support you over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.